Hello, I'm Dr. Vishal Sharma, Founder and Managing Director, Orihi Life Sciences and Pets Planet India Pet Hospitals. I started Pets Planet India Pet Hospitals in 2001 and as I was a practicing veterinarian. So during my practice, I found a great need of some safe and effective medicines for some chronic diseases like chronic kidney failure, hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, atopic skin disorders, and tick fever, and many other ailments. So at that time, these kind of medicines were not available. So I researched a lot and studied the available study material. And I took the help of experts and we developed some formulations for pets. And by that, the Orihi Life Sciences came into existence. Now, I proudly tell you that we have hundreds plus pet products and medicines as our range. At Orihi Life Sciences, our priority is our patients and our profession. Our mission is to develop most affordable and most innovative pet medicines and pet products. And we want to add value to our Indian veterinary industry. Our goal is to become a global healthcare organization. And we want to bring Indian veterinary industry at par with international standards. Thank you for being a part of this incredible journey. Thank you. Team at Orihi Life Sciences. I mean, for providing this platform, for you know, being making it so technically sound, touch wood. We are still on the uh, third or four modules, but even the feedback, what they are, you know, getting us, getting me to do, um, I'm, I'm. It's really a learning experience for me, and I'm very, very grateful. We must acknowledge the support of both the Indian Veterinary Association as well as the Avad Pet Practitioners Association. My friends and colleagues there, thank you very much. And most of all, thank you for your con continued interest. Hopefully we will, I cannot by any standards call myself a feline expert, but definitely a feline advocate, a feline medicine advocate. I enjoy doing it. If there is anything that I can share that would help other people to do and see more feline patients, for me, this is enough. Um, last, before we quickly start, it is a heavy technical session today is we will be providing a small feedback form after uh, this module. I would be very, very grateful for whatever feedback you have the time to provide uh, me, me with. Okay, so today we are going to talk about in feline infectious diseases. To make it a little less heavy, I have tried to make it a little more practical and case-based um, so that, um, you know, it, it just, re uh, cases do not always replicate textbooks word to word. And I think it's interesting to just have a few examples of uh, what certain diseases look like in, in clinical practice. Some of these diseases you are seeing very often and some maybe not that often. So let's get on with it. Um, we're going to talk about, so when we talk about infectious diseases, uh, an infectious disease is a disease that is caused by one organism in another, okay? So an infectious disease is caused by either bacteria virus, fungi, uh, protozoa, rickettsia, I could go on. Uh, we are going to narrow down today's topic a little bit of things that I thought would be of uh, importance to know if you're stepping into uh, feline practice. And number one, of course, is all the viral infections. These are very, very important. And the second subject that I have tried to emphasize on in today's presentation is the zoonotic diseases, the ones we must know about if we are going to be, and we, our staff and our clients are going to be dealing with cats at home or indoor outdoor cats. The viral infections of cats, uh, I've tried to list what I think are the important viral infections here. They're feline herpes virus 1 or FHV1, feline callosy virus, FCV, feline panleukopenia or feline parvovirus or feline distemper as it's called, um, very similar to canine parvovirus, feline coronavirus, which can sometimes mutate and become feline infectious peritonitis, something that everyone is very scared of and worried about, especially cat owners. Um, feline immunodeficiency virus or FIV and feline leukemia virus, FELV. Both of these, I think, I hope to sort of bring a little more awareness. I have discussed them in detail today. 
and of course newly added to this list is a sars cov 2 but hopefully we are that's dying down a little bit and not of so much interest anymore uh significantly missing from this list is um a very uh, fatal viral and zoonotic it cut it meets all our criteria today but i've dis- decided not to discuss it that is the rabies virus uh if we if you do have any specific questions i think information about the rabies virus tends to be quite common it is very common in um because cats are very common pets in uh, the western countries in north america actually there are more cases of cats transmitting rabies than there are of dogs and um so it it, it is something that we should be aware of and i have flagged it up in my previous lectures okay so moving on we are going to have to concentrate on a few of these viruses which i thought were uh, sort of more important to discuss feline panleukopenia or fpv infectious peritonitis fiv and felv uh, before we get on to the main subjects we're going to quickly touch on cat flu which is uh, our first two viruses actually or the feline upper respiratory tract infection so very common so viral infections cause 71% of all the mortalities in kittens less than 4 months of age so it is very very important to know about the viral infections what are the common symptoms uh, what are the treatments available if you are in a shelter situation how to diagnose these diseases so cat flu is mostly it's upper respiratory tract it's mostly eyes nose mouth um, and upper airways it can in certain circumstances go down uh, to the lungs and cause pneumonia as a sequelae and i have a little video of a kitten here and um if you have a kitten that is presented that has obvious dyspnea you do want to start thinking about um pneumonia as well in addition to your upper respiratory tract infection so it's not always contained in fact they say that in kittens less than 10 weeks bordetella bronchiseptica uh, is a bacteria and often it complicates matters and causes the bacterial pneumonia that we see as a complication of cat flu Historically cat flu is commonly caused by FHV1 we are going to call this the herpes virus is FHV1 feline calcivirus or FCV less commonly by chlamydophila felis or chlamydia felis mycoplasma species these are the respiratory mycoplasmas not the hemophilus which is in the blood cells and it's a blood parasite in cats and of course like in kennel cough in dogs bordetella bronchiseptica so mda or maternally derived antibodies we know that the mother passes these on both transplacentally and after birth through the colostrum uh, to kittens and they typically wane by 3 to 4 weeks they can go as long as 16 weeks on the outer limit we discussed this when we discussed vaccinations last uh, module but it can be highly variable so for example they find the mdas to fhv start declining by 2 to 10 weeks whereas to calcivirus it goes up to almost two and a half months they persist for two and a half months what this means is there is a certain age predilection so you will see the herpes virus in very very young kittens sometimes from two weeks onwards and you will see the calci virus possibly in slightly older kittens things don't always follow these rules but these are general guidelines to remember there are common signs and you can see um, there is a conjunctivitis in this photograph we've uh, used a dye to look for ulcers but you can also see a severe chemosis almost in this case where the conjunctiva is severely inflamed uh, all almost all these infections are characterized by a very severe uh, often copious nasal discharge and if you do do the fluorescent sign and you see a dendritic ulcer i i actually don't see them very often they're a little more chronic you do see them but uh, not that often in the eyes is this pathognomonic for fhv1 or your herpes virus okay so bins and others they looked at the clinical signs and of course sneezing is very very common it's a very a uh, common start to your infection oh my kitten is sneezing my kitten has lost its voice its uh, eyes are watering it this can happen in older unvaccinated cats or cats whose vaccinations have lapsed and they have been again to multi cat households or catteries or shelters um, or fosters cough is not so common uh, because we discussed that it is not very common that they go into the uh, lungs Uh, both the uh, upper respiratory tract viruses or cat flu viruses Ana- anorexia is there one in 10 percent to 13 percent uh, dyspnea again quite uncommon conjunctivitis is much more common with herpes virus than calcivirus whereas oral ulceration 
especially tongue ulcers does not happen with herpes virus but happens with calcivirus okay it's not very important to distinguish between the two it's nice to know of course what you're treating because sometimes for example if you miss the lingual ulcer you won't know why your cat is not eating and you need to then use a pain a uh, killer or an analgesic uh, which you may not have to use in a herpes virus infection it becomes important in multi cat households or catteries because we know that herpes virus can become quite chronic it goes and um, you know settles in the trigeminal nerve and they become latent carriers and they can recrudesce or they can show start showing clinical signs again um, in some cases where they become chronic snufflers or suffer from chronic rhinosinusitis rhinosinusitis okay of course the eye lesions can be quite dramatic in this case you can see symblepharon where you know the bulbar and the palpebral conjunctiva adhes because of inflammation and often these cats become non visual and in very severe cases you might have to enucleate this eye and to make the cat comfortable okay but there are a lot of cats who walk around with chronic herpes virus um, you know lesions that seem to manage quite well so treatment is largely symptomatic and supportive you might want to use secondary antibiotics for bordetella for mycoplasma species it is it is indicated antivirals are not uh, always indicated and not always necessary in fact you must use them with caution because they are virostatic so number one they take a long time to act we are not very sure so they are very uh, they they've been extrapolated from herpes virus you know the shingles and other infections that uh, herpes simplex causes in humans and we are not sure that cats can conjugate them or met metabolize them in the same way and therefore how effective they are there is some evidence that in chronic herpes virus infections it does reduce clinical signs and sheddings uh, and shedding of the virus um, so in multi cat households it might prevent new cats who are coming in from getting infected if earlier they used to advocate up to 90 mg per kilo twice a day or thrice a day now it's come down to the recommendation is 30 to 40 mg per kilo twice a day you can do it every 8 uh, hours as well for a 21 day course has been found to be quite effective l lysine again not always substantiated some anecdotal evidence some studies point out that there is some evidence to use of l lysine doses are quite high it's 500 mg for adults twice a day and it's 250 mg for kittens twice a day okay and this can be used long term up to 6 months to a year okay new additions to any shelter must be isolated for 14 days in shelter situations we talked about the vaccination last time they can be vaccinated as young as 4 to 6 weeks so protection is afforded it's a modified live virus vaccine so that's important to remember and it should not be used in pregnant queens i think all the uh, vaccines that we get in india for uh, the three viruses together which is herpes virus calci virus and parvo virus that we discussed in last uh, in the last lecture they are all modified live viruses so they should be avoided in pregnant cats but they are safe to use in kittens from 4 weeks onwards if necessary okay we talked about the snufflers which is the chronic rhinosinusitis and there's recrudescence at times of stress so to one uh, quick point before we move on with this is that uh, they can there's two words there's uh, recrudescence and there's recurrence of shedding so chronic carriers of herpes virus can shed at times of stress without any clinical signs it's only when you see the clinical signs whether snot comes out again there's copious discharge there's sneezing there's noisy breathing um sometimes it can progress to uh, cough as well this is a recrudescence but they can also shed virus without showing clinical signs okay before we move on to our other uh, viral diseases for today just want to point out this is something in cats that is called horse syndrome okay it's a bilateral prolapse it is not a conjunctivitis it is not a cherry eye it is just a prolapse it's not an inflammation of bilateral of the third eyelid in cats okay it can be idiopathic but there's some anecdotal evidence that it is linked to entero um, sort of enteric conditions or enteropathic conditions some people say tapeworm some people have named the new virus called tora virus and sometimes we also see it with calci virus and it can resolve on its own or it can resolve with time or it can persist for a long time so not a lot is known about it just that you're aware <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Panleukopenia virus or feline parvo virus. So this, so we know that you know herpes virus and the uh, you know upper respiratory tract infection. It's more common in the very young kittens as we get into the post weaning period. So that's thirty five days to say you know hundred days. So your one month to three months almost. Panleukopenia becomes very very common. Okay, and um, it we know that it, it it can affect all wild and domestic felids worldwide so other than felids it also affects mink raccoon even fox it was discovered actually in 1965 prior to the canine parvovirus so this was actually the first animal parvovirus that was discovered uh, we thought it was only caused by feline parvovirus but now we know that cpv or canine parvovirus 2 a b and c are also implicated but much much more rare than actually the feline parvovirus okay uh, so they can have a cat and dog in the same house and the dog can have a canine parvovirus without the cat getting infected it's ubiquitous that's it. that means it's everywhere and it's very very persistent it can persist persist up to one year in the environment and not a lot of disinfectants work against it so we will be talking about that as well cats are most susceptible when maternal antibodies wane so this is in the post weaning period for feline parvovirus it's a fatal disease and it's most common in cats uh, less than 1 year of age it can happen in older cats but they seem to deal with it much better and when treated canine parvovirus for example has a 90% recovery rate uh, seems a little optimistic but that's that's the sort of quoted in literature whereas in uh, cats it's 20 to 50% so even with treatment uh, only 1 in 5 can survive So the transmission is direct, oral nasal route by fecal contamination. It can be indirect through fomites, so feeding dishes, uh, uh, equipment, tables, and even us healthcare workers. Transplacental uh, infection is possible, and that will cause resorption, mummification, and stillbirth. So if you have stillbirth kittens or mummified fetuses, it's important to think of feline panleukopenia in the mother. And sometimes in the perinatal period, just after they are born. the the mother can pass it on and it can cause cerebral hypoplasia cerebella sorry not cerebral cerebella hypoplasia so that is the normal cerebellum here 
and this is a cerebellar hypoplasia that is caused by feline panleukopenia. So basically cats show signs of ataxia and incoordination and this can be attributed to uh, exposure in the perinatal period of feline panleukopenia. Here is a cat that we had that um, seemed otherwise fine, uh, but suffered from cerebellar, um, from ataxia that was attributed to cerebellar hypoplasia because it had no history of any trauma or anything else. Just show you a video of what it looked like. So you can see there is, and other than that, the cat was healthy, fine, eating normally. Um, and the people who had adopted it were quite, quite, quite concerned with, you can see how wobbly and ataxic it is, especially on the hind limbs, okay? So other common clinical signs. Um, so this would be a kitten who's recovered and the signs of the hypoplasia will persist. So clinical signs, the incubation period is five to nine days. You do get a severe hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, much like in canine parvovirus. Uh, you, a significant uh, fever is seen with temperatures going up to 104 to 107 degrees Fahrenheit, lethargy, anorexia, dehydration, abdominal pain, if you do look at the back of the eye or the fundic exam, you'll see retinal lesions in some cases, not in all, which are just discrete gray foci on the retina. So just gray circle, circular lesions on the retina. And even in spite of su support or if treatment is not given early enough, mortality is due to hypotension and septic shock. There's your hemorrhagic diarrhea, uh, which is very characteristic. There's also the similar smell, very much like uh, we, we, we see in uh, dogs. And in post-mortem, you can see the severe anemia and the hemorrhagic intestines in one of the kittens that we unfortunately lost to parvovirus. It's quite easy to detect it. So the diagnosis is quite easy. Uh, signalment, of course, you have an unvaccinated young cat with hemorrhagic diarrhea, inappetence, all the classical clinical signs. Uh, a panleukopenia on blood test, so your white cell counts of less than 2 into 10 raised to 3 per microliter ca uh, carries a very poor prognosis. So everything that can be done should be initiated in these cases. That, there is an IDEX CPV snap test. So this is for canine parvovirus, and this is the snap test on the right. So this is a negative test with a, a control uh, spot positive and nothing else. And... Um, it has been validated to be used for feline parvovirus as well. And here you can see a very faint dot, but any test dot is significant and positive because it tests for the field strain of the parvovirus, not the vaccination strain, okay? PCR is also possible, but um, yeah. And that can be done. So a PCR of a rectal swab is what is used as a sample for both the IDEX test, which is a SNAP test, as well as the uh, PCR test. So here is a blood report from a cat that had uh, a severe panleukopenia. And you can see the white cell count is down to 1.6. Uh, at this point, everything else, albumin is also a prognostic indicator. And uh, if it goes very low, you have to control for uh, effusions then. And that should be something that is monitored in cats. And this is another cat whose rectal swab was pos positive for uh, feline parvovirus. So any cat that is presenting early diagnosis just to up your support and treatment can be quite helpful. And this is actually the one of the... Um, so on our report at the bottom, we mention uh, the study that validates the use of the CPV kits for FPV because this is extra label use. Uh, but we are using it regularly and have had good results. So this basically says that you can use the commercial ELISA for canine parvovirus for the detection of feline panleukopenia. How do we manage these cats? So again, signs um, of severe dehydration, you want to be putting in your IV cannulas uh, as soon as possible. You want to be offering enteral or oral support. You want to feed these cats um, as much as you can. Aggressive fluid therapy, antibiotics, antiemetics, uh, B vitamins, rule out concurrent endoparasitism. This is very important. Do, do a stool test. Very often they are positive for cystoisospora and that needs to be dealt with because when they're already immunosuppressed, that can become a problem in itself. Probiotics are very helpful. Uh, any probiotic of your choice. Again, easy diets, recovery diets or diets which uh, support 
uh, sort of in enteric infections, feed them early as long as you've controlled the vomiting. This, this is a very useful thing. Filgrastim has been used. It's a recombinant human granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Basically, it brings up your uh, granulocytes or your uh, neutrophils. Okay, in the in the white blood cells, it does. It's not always effective, but it is worth trying. It seems to be relatively safe. There can be some pain at injection site. This is my only uh, observation when I've used it subcutaneously. In some cats, there's some. So maybe give it in a fluid bleb. Five to six milligrams per kg subcut for three to five days is the recommended dose, and it is available at most human uh, pharmacies. You can also try recombinant feline interferon omega. Unfortunately, this is not yet available to us. There is human recombinant interferon omega, which is indicated as supportive treatment for a lot of the viral infections. Uh, I've personally found it very difficult to uh, obtain some of this, and it can be in, uh, expensive, but down the line, we do have some dosages for those as well. Prevention, very, very easy. Vaccinate those kittens. Uh, very difficult in the feral cats because there are so many kittens there and um, it's difficult sometimes to vaccinate all kittens before they get infected. Because as you know, by the time they finish weaning, they're already uh, infected with feline panleukopenia. So isolate the affected individual. Disinfectant, it is actually resistant to a lot of disinfectant and the indicated disinfection is one is to 32 or 5% diluted bleach. So a normal a la bleach or whatever the bleach is that you're using for the household, one cap full in a bucket of water works very well as a disinfectant. We sometimes use it to wash tables as well after we've treated parvovirus patients. Vaccinations of young kittens with a modified live virus vaccine at six to eight weeks of age with a booster uh, is indicated. Okay. Someone had asked the last time a very interesting question on vaccination, and we will address that in the questions section. Moving on to perhaps a slightly less discussed and less diagnosed virus, which is the feline leukemia virus. Okay. The feline leukemia virus is a gamma retrovirus. Okay. It is just drawing up. Yeah, it causes persistent infections in cats. There is vertical and horizontal transmission possible, and mostly it is transmitted by close contact in addition to bites and scratches. So also sharing the same food bowls can and water bowls can spread FELV or leukemia virus. It seems to have a varying clinical course. Okay, so now FELV, it's a gamma retrovirus. It's an RNA virus. It enters the blood and it transcripts into a DNA virus or a proviral DNA, which is called P27. This is what circulates. It enters the macrophages. It replicates, okay, and then becomes a sort of a subclinical latent persistent infection. So depending on the host immunity, there are different scenarios that are possible once a cat has got infected. Uh, there is a progressive infection. So what we are testing for is we are testing for this P27 proviral DNA, okay, which is in the blood. It's a viremia. And when there is progressive infection, all these cats are persistently positive for this proviral DNA. They often show the FELV associated disease because there is a possibility that they are infected, but they will not show disease for a long time, okay, or they may never show disease. So progressive infections are usually associated with disease. And these are the guys, because they are persistently shedding, they are the ones who will then infect naive uh, cats or patients. Okay. The second possibility is a regressive infection. Again, a cat has been exposed. It has got infected. There is a transient proviral DNA. But the cat's immune system is able to counteract this controls the infection to a level where it is not detectable anymore. There is no clinical sign, so there is no associated disease. But these cats can sometimes remain carriers of FELV. Okay, but sometimes they will then on subsequent tests, test negative. These are the two main types, actually. Uh, more common than progressive is the regressive infection. So we see a lot of subclinical FELV, which later on goes on to create other problems. Um, and a lot less of the progressive infection. Just important to know about abortive infections. Again, the cat has got exposed. If you test it in this time, transiently, there might be a viremia. It may be positive for the um, viral antigen because when we are testing, we are only testing for viral antigen, the P27, the proviral DNA. Okay. 
but they show no signs subsequent tests are all negative and it is very i mean you may not even catch this infection in these cats but at some point they have had exposure okay and focal infections have been cited in literature very uncommon they can be in the spleen lymph node mammary glands uh, you know these 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 are un uncommon things and uh, very very rare and not clinically relevant really so i see very very little fi fiv felv we are actually routinely testing for fiv felv when we offer it to the clients when we do uh, um neutering or sterilizations because they're all a lot of our patients are rescued cats uh, a lot of them do are from multi cat households and just important for a long term prognosis and monitoring of the cats it's important to know their status in a lot of countries i mentioned the last time that it is uh, essential or mandatory to establish the fiv felv status of every feline patient uh, here of course it is not and like i said it, these are not cheap tests they can add up uh, uh, to a client's expenses so it, it it's it's an optional test um, unless the cat is showing other signs that support that they might have associated disease so fish was one of the cats that uh, actually presented with felv it's a it's a it's the disease when it happens is common in young free roaming cats you know um, these are young male uh, outbred free roaming cats uh, there is often a bone marrow suppression non regenerative anemia so you can see in fish uh, fishes blood reports i hope this is clear to you that there is a macrocytosis hypochromia anisocytosis leukocytosis and quite quite a severe anemia that uh, he's already come in with uh, along with an inflammatory uh, sort of leukogram there is immune suppression and so these cats are very prone to secondary infections uh, there is also a predisposition to lymphoid neoplasia so they the felv cats are prone to high grade t cell lymphomas and sometimes to conditions which cause enteritis marrow aplasia marrow uh, aplasia which means basically that the bone marrow is not uh, producing the blood cells that it should uh, as well as reproductive tumors okay so these are all co common scenarios for associated disease so let's see what happened to fi uh, to fish okay so when we diagnose fish we diagnosed it with the idex test this idex test is a combination test because it diagnoses for both fiv and felv together the left side dot the top is the control dot the left side dot is fiv and the right hand side dot is felv like i mentioned even the pcr and this snap test are both looking for this p27 antigen uh, there is an immunofluorescence test but there this is not so uh, easily available or useful because again it tells us only exposure and virus isolation is not available easily in a commercial setting but where it is this can be used for diagnosis okay so fish actually presented he he is in uh, he was about a 5 5 year old cat not very old and uh, he presented with not eating uh, icteric a very uh, you know uh, painful abdomen and he did have other associated diseases when we tested him you can see on this photograph the right hand side dot it is he is positive so he is positive for the antigen to feline leukemia virus which is the p27 uh, on his blood other than the anemia initially there was it was nothing very remarkable but you can see there is a hyperglobulinemia and this is something that is common with a lot of the viral diseases in cats is the hyperglobulinemia which should be picked up and um you know possibly used as a signal for further testing on the radiographs we found a severely enlarged spleen this whole so in cat radiographs this is a difference from dogs it is not normal to visualize the spleen so if you are visualizing the spleen uh, it need not be this big as it is in fish uh it is abnormal again in this radiograph also you can see the spleen and we also picked up that the left kidney looked a little bigger than the right kidney we went on to do some imaging and uh again we found the spleen was quite enlarged and in ultrasound a cat spleen needs to be less than 1 cm in width uh, anything more than that it is abnormal um again the kidney was a little enlarged the left kidney with a small pyo like a granulomatous lesion we weren't sure whether there was concurrent infection with something else and very enlarged jejunal lymph nodes these hypoechoic structures are your jejunal lymph nodes your mesenteric lymph nodes and those were enlarged uh the cat did not do well um in spite of treatment and we obviously also saw it in in the last stage and we could not rule out that there was concurrent lymphoma in this cat 
Okay. When you do get an FELV cat, if it is asymptomatic, classify the owner that there is not much to worry about this. I mean, because we're not testing a lot of cats, we don't know the worldwide incidence of FIV, FELV is 25 to 5%. That's, you know, a minimum of one in 20 to one in 40 cats. Uh, we are not testing every cat for it. We are testing very, very few cats. Uh, my experience is that FIV is much, much more common than FELV is, okay? Uh, asymptomatic cats, six monthly reviews, check their uh, kidney status, check their uh, CBCs, look for those anemia, start supporting them at the earliest and uh, look for those lymphomas and concurrent infections. Symptomatic cats, these often will have need to have because they are immunocompromised. So they will need to have uh, antibiotics, bactericidal antibiotics if possible, longer course of time than you would in a usual cat. These are the differences. You know, if you do a surgery on an FELV cat, you want to cover it with an antibiotic. You want to use a bactericidal, you want to use it for a longer time. If it comes in sick with something, try and do culture and sensitivity, use that appropriate antibiotic again as long as it is needed. Feline interferon omega has also been suggested as one of the possible treatments. And these are quite easy to disinfect and treat. So as long as, um, you know, the common disinfections are used in a cattery situation, for example, it's not necessary to always uh, isolate these cats completely. You know, it, uh, it may be stressful for the cats. And there is a uh, there is a vaccine available, not in India, uh, which is called Filovax, but it is not one of the core vaccines that is indicated for cats. Uh, if anyone is interested in reading further, there are retroviral uh, management guidelines, which are uh, established by the American Association of Feline Practitioners, very, very useful, and gives you all possible scenarios and what to do and how to do, because the owners get very, very concerned. I mean, you're telling them that their cat has leukemia virus and they don't know what it means. So it's important that us as vets understand. viruses. The second brother to FELV is the feline immunodeficiency virus. So just to bear in mind, a parvovirus kitten will come in with hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. A, 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 a feline a cat flu kitten will come in with a snotty nose and, you know, dyspnea or fever. FIV, FELV animals will may come in looking completely normal. So unless we are looking for uh, the viruses, we may not necessarily find them unless... Uh, they actually go ahead and fall sick with something secondary. FIV is again a retrovirus, uh, much like FELV. So it is again one of these gamma retroviruses. It's spread between cats, but predominantly through biting. So the predisposed uh, animals are male cats uh, who are outdoors, have exposure to other cats. And when they are fighting, they land up spreading FIV or immunodeficiency virus to each other. Infected cats develop antibodies, but they cannot clear the infection. So they are carrying antibodies. We are testing for antibodies in case in case of FIV, uh, but they do remain persistently infected. Infection is most common in adult entire because the, you know they, they're territorial, they will fight more. Um, and you, it is something that you must look for in sick cats or outbred uh, uh, free roaming male cats. Again, like I mentioned, worldwide prevalence is one, is one in 20 to one in 40. Uh, so it's it's quite common. It's more common than we think. Clinical signs. So we actually now have a uh, classic, and I want to uh, you know introduce these classic sim symptoms that the cats seem to come in with when they have FIV or FELV. That may you know if you don't want to test every single cat, at least these cats, it must make you think of these viruses as as differentials uh, when you're dealing with these conditions. So cytopenias are common. We know that bone marrow suppression does occur. Uh, so you know, your anemia, maybe your platelet count is reduced, um, white cell counts in certain cases. Uh, very chronic gingival stomatitis 
So one of the conditions, so calcivirus, one of the conditions that it is linked to long-term in chronic calcivirus infections is feline chronic gingivostomatitis that we discussed in the last lecture. Again, FIV is another differential uh, in those cases, FIV, FELV, both of them. Muscle wasting, we see lymphadom, lymph adenomegaly, in, enlarged lymph nodes. Again, immune-mediated disease and secondary infection. Chronic and refractory problems are typical. Similarly, long-term antibiotics, uh, specific antibiotics to treat them, diagnosis of what the secondary problems might be. And it increases the risk of a lymphoma, again, but a different kind of lymphoma. So these, those were T-cell lymphomas. These are high-grade B-cell in atypical uh, locations, okay? So who do we have here? We have a cat. Again, we see the anemia, which is quite typical, low hemoglobin. Um, and low erythrocyte counts. If we go on to do a reticulocyte count, often they are at the lower end of the range, indicating that these are non-regenerative anemias. The chronic gingivostomatitis, some of these photographs you have seen in the last lecture. The difference is uh, that, like I mentioned, in a lot of cases of uh, chronic gingivostomatitis, uh, it is immune mediated and it will require full mouth extractions for resolution. Whenever we are doing full mouth extractions, it's it's a it's a it's it's a long process for the cat and painful process for the cat. Um, it's important to warn the owners that there is not always a hundred percent resolution. The gingivitis or the gum inflammation may be present even after all teeth are removed. We we always do post operative radiographs to look for tooth remaining tooth remnants. So that would not be the cause, but we still find that some cats. Um, this would be less than 10% of cats, but they do persist to have inflammation in these cases. So this is what a normal gum should look like. You see the remaining teeth, so it's it's reacting to the plaque. And when you remove the teeth, you have a normal healthy gum again. So in cases where it continues to be inflamed, it is important to look for FIV, FELV. And you remember Clementine from our last um, lecture, and she had a chronic gingivostomatitis with a bleeding mouth and she was FIV positive. So we like to do it before to then warn the owners that look, there it is palliative. It still helps to do extractions, but you may not see complete resolution of signs. Okay. So gingivostomatitis is one of the uh, sort of characteristics in three, four to six year old cats that uh, we see the cats who are carrying FIV, often they are male outdoor cats. Clementine wasn't, so they don't always follow the rule book. Uh, the other uh, sort of presentation that we see is typified by Van here. Van is a cat, it's a distinguished looking um, six-year-old male neutered cat who came to us. And these cats who are five or six-year-old will present with an azotemia. So it's a creatinine of 8.7. Uh, he's been treated previously um, and again, accompanied by a significant, significant hyperglobulinemia. So when the globulin goes above six and seven is when you have to start thinking of a virus involvement. I have shown two ultrasound photographs. So this is one's kidney on, on, the, um, on the top photograph and you can see this is an enlarged kidney. It is not a typical CKD shrunken fibrosed crenated kidney, but it's an enlarged kidney, but with complete uh, with a hyperechoic uh, cortex and loss of differentiation. Uh, and just at the bottom, a normal uh, kidney for reference what it should look like, okay? So this is a typical uh, picture that we see and then we suspect FIV in these cats and we test them for it. And you can see the left side um, dot is, a test dot has uh, come up as a positive and this is an FIV positive on the same combo test that tests for FIV and FELV. Diagnosis is by the patient size serological test that detects antibodies against FIV. Uh, the SNAP combo by IDEX, but there are other tests as well by other companies. The positive test result, remember for FIV, we are testing antibody. For FELV, it's the P27 antigen. The positive result, therefore, needs to be confirmed by PCR. The PCR, again, detects the pro-DNA of FIV and is useful for differentiating between active infection and vaccine or maternally derived antibodies. What this means is, um, uh, we, if if this kitten, for example, okay, is positive, so you have you have three scenarios. You have a cat who is positive on the on the PCR, okay. Sometimes the mother will pass on antibodies to the kitten. Therefore, 
we try not to test kittens before they're six months of age. We know that most FIV related illness, we can get leukemia as young as one year of age, sorry, lymphoma, not leukemia, lymphoma as young as one year of age, but usually not before six months of age. So just to sort of remove the uh, possibility of a maternally derived antibody causing a positive, we uh, do it after after four or five months of age, okay? When, when after 16 weeks, the maternally derived antibody should not a cause of false positive. So in this case, we are getting a positive for an exposure. We've done the SNAP test. It's positive. It's telling you the cat's been exposed. Ideally, you need to go ahead and do the PCR and confirm that there is an active infection, not just exposure. A lot of times PCR is not available or may not be accurate. Uh, the PCR is with the blood. The blood is the sample, uh, same as with the SNAP test. But uh, if it is not possible, another possibility is if the cat is clinically well, just wait and repeat the test in six months time, okay? Because if it is just a transient exposure, then we know that they will be persistently infected, but only if it is in case a, a kitten, then it will come negative on the next test. Otherwise it will remain positive, okay? We do not vaccinate for FIV, so that point does not apply in our case. Um, the PCR is less sensitive than the serological test, so it may not always give you a positive. And so sometimes it's better to repeat the serological test after a time interval. And if you have two positive six months apart, your cat is persistently infected for FIV, your patient. Okay. It's important to look for concurrent infections in all FIV cases. And I showed you one and I showed you um, Clementine. Clementine, we managed to do a full panel because the owner was uh, had agreed to it. So we tested for the antigen okay, of FIV and FELV and she was negative for the antigens for both, even though she was antibody positive on two different tests six months apart, but she was positive for mycoplasma hemophilus. And we see this very often concurrently contributing to the anemia. And this can be treated with doxycycline for four weeks. And then we retested her and she was negative for the mycoplasma hemophilus, okay? Whereas one in his case, uh, suddenly uh, his azotemia was brought under control. And I think his creatinine came down to um, almost, you know, 3.3, he was doing clinically very well but suddenly took badly and we tested for toxoplasma and he was positive and he also responded to treatment for toxoplasma and continues to be stable, okay? So it's important to look for those concurrent infections with FIV and FELV. Uh, management is treating secondary infections, very similar to FELV using culture and sensitivity, prolonged courses of antibiotics. If, if you do diagnose lymphoma, either by uh, FNAC of the spleen or the lymph nodes, then they respond well to multi-drug therapy and should be regularly monitored. It's important to do chest radiographs because sometimes they can get mediastinal lymphomas and not show abdominal uh, abnormalities on imaging, okay? They should be regularly monitored for neutropenia. They're already compromised in their immunity. Antiviral drugs are available, but again, limited evidence of efficacy uh, with clinical cases. Sometimes you might have to resort to these. Uh, and they seem to be quite quite safe with monitoring. Uh, so AZT at five to 10 milligrams per kg orally uh, or subcar, uh, I've only used it orally every 12 hours. Feline interferon omega is again, not available. If you have it available, uh, it can be used at the same dosages. And here is the dose for human interferon omega in case you can get your hands on it. For 50 IU sublingual or under the tongue, uh, 24 hours, it's, it's, it's proven to be efficacious for seven days on alternating weeks for six months, okay? Uh, Lee, keep a brace, and then you can do another cycle after two months. This has been described uh, with good effect. Prevention of spread, they are uh, susceptible to all common disinfectants. Keep the cats indoors so that they cannot go and fight and spread FIV to other cats. Uh, vaccine is not available to us, and neutering the cats also helps them to fight less and prevent either cat aggression. Okay, so uh, moving on to FIP, possibly our uh, you know biggest and most important uh, feline virus. So I've kept the best for last. So it's common in cats housed in groups. Uh, it is caused by the feline enteric coronavirus, which is largely, which is very, very common. Uh, and it causes self-limiting diarrhea in cats. It's not a very scary virus at all. And zero prevalence when they tested for antibodies in wild and feral feeler populations, they found 20 to 100 percent, depending on which geographic area. I'm pretty sure we are close to 100 percent rather than the 20 percent. I mean, we have so much of uh, 
uh, fib that I think coronavirus must be everywhere. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well. So fib is a fatal. So fib, what happens is again, cat is uh, infected by the feline coronavirus. Uh, this goes to the macrophages, and when the immunity cannot, uh, you know, sort of live up to getting rid of this uh, virus, then hang on, just a second. Yeah, then it mutates to form FIP. So your coronavirus will then mutate, and there are many mutations possible to form the FIP virus, which then replicates within the macrophages. It causes an immune-mediated vasculitis. And we see two forms. We see a effusive form where there is a leakage of very protein rich uh, fluid into the body cavities. And we also see a dry fit, which is a pyogranulomatous form. Okay. So it is an inflammatory, it's a severe immune mediated inflammatory condition. And often it is progressive and fatal. Okay. Develops in less than 10% of FCOV zero positive cats. Is it because of an inadequate immune response? Yes, it is likely. Okay. So even if all the cats in the household get FCOV, it is not necessary that they will develop FIP, even if one individual has developed FIP. It's most commonly seen in cats, they say less than three years and more than 10 years. So apparently you can see it in nearly geriatric cats who have concurrent uh, comorbidities uh, and also in very young cats. Uh, sexually intact cats, male and purebred cats, so Persian breeds are more predisposed. Okay, transmission is the orofecal route because you know it's the coronavirus that is infecting them, not the FIP, really. And there are two forms, as we discussed: the wet FIP, which is the effusive form, and the dry FIP, which is the pyogranulomatous form. Okay. What are the clinical signs we see a multi this is really it's it's i think you know to call it a uh, conundrum is really a, 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 an adequate term because it is it is a diagnostic conundrum okay there is multi organ involvement there is fever of unknown origin so you get pyrexia that seems to come and go there can be chronic weight loss and hyporexia so they're eating less than normal but some can continue to eat very well even with their bellies full of fluid it's it's really remarkable uh, these are young male cats very often which are from multi-cat environments. It seems to be resistant to antibiotic treatment. Uh, you can see icteris or jaundice. And in, like I mentioned before, sometimes the icteris is more uh, prominent on the ear pinnae or on the ventral abdomen, even before it is on the nose or the mucous membranes. So it's important to look in these areas. There is There can be dyspnea, open mouth breathing, especially if there is the effusive form, uh, abdominal distension, uh, uveitis is common, so uh, white, eyes and um, blue eyes and any uh, sort of uh, uh, you know indications of uveitis is it is definitely a differential perivascular cuffing when you're looking at the fundus you look at the hazy the borders of the blood vessels become hazy they have like a grayish outline and this is perivascular cuffing it's not so easy to pick up i think um, you can see some granulomatous lesions sometimes and very rarely it can progress to a retinal detachment only because of fib the other uh, causes can be feline hypertension. You do in the dry form often see neurological signs, apparently less than 6% of the cats uh, show neurological signs. And this has a very poor prognosis. So even with treatment, uh, cats with neurological signs have a poor prognosis. Okay. So Raka is a female cat that you saw in the earlier photograph who came in with very similar signs. She had what we suppose was a dry fib because she had fever that was non-responsive. She was losing weight. She had days when she was not eating at all and days when she would eat a little bit. And she seemed to progress to both the bilirubinemia, or the jaundice, as well as uh, ocular and neurological signs. And what is very interesting is we saw her first in May uh, in 2020 and... Um, she had a hyperglobulinemia and there is a ratio that is uh, you know 0 uh, uh, 0 0.4 less than uh, 0 0.8 and 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 when which should albumin globulin ratio we're going to talk about this later which should make you think of fib but what i'd like to point out here is initially when she came in uh, there was a hyperglobulinemia but later on when she started showing her uh, icterus and azotemia and um, other signs and actually became effusive, uh, her globulins fell, her globulin levels fell. And again, this is something that I have noticed that when they actually start effusing, suddenly there is a drop in the globulin levels. Okay, there you go. 
So um, this is her radiographs in May and uh, very clear outlines to all the serol serosal organs, no evidence of effusion, no evidence of severe abdominal distension. All these gray areas in cats are fat. So fat has a darker opacity than soft tissue, but a lighter opacity than air or gas. Okay, so this is all fat, which then provides the serosal detail. Important to remember that kittens do not have a lot of fat. And so there is sometimes poor serosal detail in kittens and difficult to make out whether they're just lean or whether they have effusion. This is Raka a month later, the same cat with definite eff uh, effusion. It wasn't a very severe effusion, but it was. She's also azotemic, she's dehydrated. And you can see she has a uh, lot of stools that are here. Seems to be some renal enlargement as well, which is pushing the colon down, okay? They can also prevent, so they say 65% of those cats will have, uh, if they have a wet form, right? This is not the dry form, because the cats with a dry form will have pyogranulomatous lesions, which I will talk about, but they will not have any effusion. But if they have effusion, it's most common that they will have abdominal effusion. So that number is, I think, 65%, more than half. Less than 10% will have pleural effusion. And this is Shifu, actually, who presented with a pleural effusion. He was a young male Persian cat. Um, and he came to us with this uh, pleural effusion. And 25% of one in four will have both. Very, very uncommonly, I think less than 5% can have also pericardial effusion only with no other effusion. They can have scrotal edema. Again, very odd, you know, sometimes you're doing a uh, 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 castration and you'll notice that the scrotal scrotum is enlarged and effusive. Uh, and this could be a cat with underlying flip, you know, for example. And um, it's and uh, so the you know the, these are and sometimes there's polyarthropathy. So these are the very uncommon ones, which clinically I don't I don't see very often. Okay, but the pleural effusion and abdominal effusion are very very common, as I feel is the dry fit, but it is more difficult to diagnose. So you've obviously tapped this effusion. Whenever you see effusion, the next step you've seen it on the X-ray. You've gone ahead and confirmed it with the ultrasound, and then you do the an ultrasound guided tap if you even sometimes you can do a blind tap as well uh, um, but you've tapped it and very uh, very uh, sort of classically you will see inflammatory exudates so your microscopic examination has revealed degenerative neutrophils and foamy macrophages okay this is very typical of an it's an inflammatory condition and this is what you've got and you have no organism so you've ruled out a bacterial culture and in this case you've ruled out a lymphoma which are the other common causes of effusion in cats other than very important to mention toxoplasma which can happen concurrently with FIP okay so this is another presentation of a cat uh, who had come in, Goldie, and she had a completely different form. And she had what we thought, again, was a dry fib. Uh, on ultrasound, on x-ray, her kidneys, again, seemed enlarged. But you can see serosal detail. You can see the outlines of the intestine here. I hope you can see my cursor. And that means you have good serosal detail. That means there is no effusion. Um, and then we went ahead and did the ultrasound and you can see horrible kidneys with perinephric effusion and loss of normal corticomedullary differentiation. And you can see circular pyogranulomatous lesions. And this is very common in dry FIP in cats. Again, we did a kidney FNAC and we found only plasma cells and foamy macrophages and some proteinaceous uh, inflammatory material and a lymphocytic neutrophilic inflammatory lesion. Uh, this cat was again uh, diagnosed with FIP. So like I mentioned, it's a diagnostic conundrum, okay? There are some typical changes that can be seen on, we, we, we try and add up all the evidence and say likely this cat has FIP, okay? Because it's not always possible to get that one test result and it has a very, very poor prognosis, uh, at least until recently. So um, it's important to, to know what are the pointers that you're going to use to uh, bring it all together. Okay, I'm gonna go move a little fast because we're, uh, we're one hour into our lecture. So lymphopenia, neutrophilia, anemia are all classical. Elevated globulin concentrations, more than 70% of cats are hyperglobulinemia with that albumin globulin ratio, something that every cat should be tested for and it should show up on your uh, blood reports. Elevated liver enzymes is possible and elevated bilirubin in the absence of elevated liver enzymes is also possible along with a clinical jaundice or yellowing. 
we've taken out this effusion we've taken it out from the abdomen we've taken it out and you in addition to a cytology there's a fluid analysis that is recommended and there are certain certain pointers here number one is your gross appearance okay the gross appearance is um usually it can be different but it's usually clear to yellow it is not turbid and it is not uh, 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 you know it is not bloody but it can be as well uh, fibrinous so it's thick and when you shake it it foams okay this is classical it's a very proteinaceous effusion it's a very high protein proteins if you measure it's more than 35 grams per liter very low cell count it is not it's a lot of you know uh, inflammatory exudate without a lot of uh, Uh, cells in it okay so less than 5 into t- uh, 10 raised to 3 per ml cytology again macrophages are very common neutrophils we know that fip uh, virus replicates in the macrophages and uh, they are very involved in the inflammation and this is the ratio we were talking about the albumin globulin ratio when it is less than 4 or 4 uh, it's usually fip if it is more than 8 fip is very unlikely so even if you have an effusion and you have an albumin globulin ratio that is high unless like i mentioned the effusion has already started sometimes this does fall so be careful uh, use all your tests in conjunction with the with each other uh, and if you have something that's more than eight always rule out do the cytology do the culture rule out other causes of um, exudates or effusion in cats protein levels you look at the albumin levels Uh, alpha 1 acid glycoprotein we don't regularly measure for this and the positive or the gold standard for diagnosing fip in cats is a immuno staining or immuno histochemical staining for this fcov antigen because we know it is an fcov antigen uh, in either lymph node tissue or effusion okay this is not 100% sensitive but when it is positive it is the gold standard for diagnosing fip a rivalta test is very suggestive and very easy to perform and it is a patient site test how do you do it you uh, take a 7 to 8 ml of distilled water in a test tube uh, you add 1 ml of glacial acetic acid or acetic acid sometimes uh, you take a drop of effusion if it is not if it's very clear and not yellowish also then it, you can add methylene blue as a dye like we have in this video just to color it and make it visible and you layer it on you layer it on top of the fluid okay if the drop mixes in and dissolves it's negative if it goes to the bottom like a jellyfish and or slinks sinks slowly or stays at the top this is your positive rivalta test if you have a positive your positive predictive value is 86% okay and if your rivalta test is negative it's even higher that means it is very unlikely that your cat has fit okay thankfully videos are playing today so we've colored this by methylene blue and you see my little jellyfish that is sinking okay so diagnosis serology confirms only exposure to fcov which doesn't mean anything we know that 100% of cats in a population can be positive but they don't have fit okay this is your classical effusion fit effusion that we talked about the yellow clear uh, fluid rt pcr is more uh, is is sort of the definitive pcr but um, it it we don't have rt pcr we have the regular pcr for it very few universities do offer rt pcr but i'm not sure it is available commercially uh, if it is do let me know because it's important uh, that we do the quantitative or the rt pcr not the regular pcr to diagnose fib uh, because it's it's more sensitive MRI and CSF tap for neurological symptom symptoms, but in these cases, even if it's negative, it does not rule out fit. So what we are working on is really putting all our factors together: signalment, clinical signs, laboratory tests, albumin, albumin globulin ratios, clinical signs, imaging, and how the cat responds to treatment to say that we have fit or we don't have fit. Okay, management of fit for a long time, fit was considered a death sentence for cats. breeders will get very very upset when they think that their cat has fit and uh, we see at least i personally we see a lot of uh, fit or at least what we suspect is fit uh, we are we are rarely able to confirm it uh, but hopefully that that will happen soon as well um, what we try and do is we try and rule out other causes and uh, form an index of suspicion earlier there was gs there's a nucleoside analog called gs441524 this is still available and still in use it is on the black market 
and it was very difficult to procure so there were facebook groups like closed groups that would then pro procure it it's very expensive now there's a website called basmi fip uh, some of you might have used it already i think the cost of a treatment course comes to about uh, to, you know between 18 and 25000 for a cat so if owners are willing to pay for it you can go online to basmi fip and actually procure these uh, little uh, files of gs44152 Uh, mutian was another nucleoside analog that was used and found to be effective and these are quite safe so they used for 12 week periods 12 week treatment protocols are there and um, uh, they they've been found to be quite safe feline interferon omega has a very good uh, supportive role in uh, control of fip and uh, as of quite recently um, fip is now a treatable disease because uh, the university of sydney a team has Uh, studied remdesivir uh, which has grown in availability thanks to covid and it, this is these are one of the you know possibly only favorable outcome of covid is that today we know that remdesivir is as effective it, it belongs to the same family as gs441524 in fact it also has one of these numbers um and it's a nucleoside analog and it has very good antiviral effect at 10 mg per day a uh, package per, per day subcutaneous or iv for 3 days uh, for these 3 days the cat should be hospitalized and monitored after which it can be 6 mg per kg per day subcut for 12 weeks okay uh lim i have limited experience for this remdesivir again not very easy uh, to get hold of uh, the cats the owners the compliance all of it but um, a lot of people are using it and uh, it has anecdotally been very very success successful prevention is by isolating the affected cats obviously while they have fip and if you know they have fip then uh, if you can prevent other cats around from getting the fcov it's useful but if the cats around have already been exposed and they have not been infected then unlikely that this patient will infect them so fip is not infectious fcov is and then it mutates normal disinfectants work and uh, they can shed for up to 7 weeks 